So what I'd like to do today is talk about what I believe to be the most important collaboration of the American founding, and that is the relationship between, or I perhaps would characterize it this way, the unlikely partnership between George Washington and Alexander Hamilton. This extraordinary alliance between a wealthy Virginia planter and a brash immigrant from the Caribbean helped to win the Revolutionary War and establish a new order for the ages. While other founding friendships attracted more attention due to the poetic and philosophic nature of their correspondence of thinking, particularly of Jefferson and Madison or Jefferson and Adams, the more practical Washington-Hamilton partnership was just as important, for these two men thought continentally, as Hamilton put it, and worked together to build a nation. These men fought for the better part of 22 years to win independence and to prove that societies of men are really capable of establishing good government from reflection and choice. Theirs was an unlikely alliance. George Washington and Alexander Hamilton could not have been more different. Washington was a gentleman farmer from the patrician colony of Virginia and was the owner of a great estate enriched by the labor of African slavery. As a rising member of the Virginia gentry, Washington satisfied the expectations of his station by entering into public service. Hamilton, however, was an illegitimate child, or as John Adams liked to say, the bastard brat of a Scotch peddler, <laughs> and an immigrant from the West Indies. He was a self-made man who made his way to, the United, to America excuse me, and earned his positions in the army and in the government. Now, despite their differences, these two men shared the same political principles that would lead to a series of policies which shaped the foreign and economic policies of the new nation. George Washington came to increasingly lean on Hamilton's advice as president <laughs> and almost invariably agreed with his policy recommendations and constitutional opinions. The retirement of the public debt, the creation of a national bank, the proclamation of neutrality, the outrage against French minister Genet, the response to the Whiskey Rebellion and Jay's Treaty all drove a wedge between Washington and Hamilton on one side and Washington's fellow Virginians, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. This wedge, as you all know, led to the creation of two political parties, much to President Washington's dismay, but in some ways were an inevitable result of Washington and Hamilton's great collaboration. If George Washington was the indispensable man of the American founding, then it is my contention that the collaboration between Washington and Hamilton was the indispensable alliance that determined the outcome of the founding and the creation of the United States. And yet, remarkably, this collaboration, this alliance, has not been given its due. Now, certainly Washington uh, has been the subject of numerous biographies. We're in the city named after him, the capital city, the beautiful monument down on the mall. Certainly, Washington has been given his due. But the relationship, the collaboration between Hamilton and Washington I don't think even to this day has been fully acknowledged, and I'll get into some reasons for why I think that has been towards the end of my talk. What makes Washington and Hamilton unique from other founding collaborations was their, that their bond was forged in the crucible of the Revolutionary War. Now, I've never served in combat, but I teach people at the Naval War College who have seen multiple tours of duty in Afghanistan and Iraq. And from what I understand, and I'm sure you've heard this from anyone you may know who's been in a combat situation, the bond that's forged in combat is like any other forged between two human beings. So Washington and Hamilton forge this bond during the Revolutionary War and go on to form the, co the core cadre of leadership in the struggle, certainly from independence during the war itself, but also in terms of driving what I call the nationalist forces that would culminate in a more perfect union formed at the Constitutional Convention in 1787. 
and they would go on to breathe life into the, new, into the institutions of the early republic while setting important precedents as president and secretary of the treasury. Let me talk a little bit about Hamilton's role as treasury secretary. Hamilton's economic policies implemented under Washington's aegis were acts of nation building that launched the United States on the path to becoming an economic superpower. Critics of these policies tend to focus their fire exclusively on the Treasury Secretary, but, and this is important to note, as George Washington would later tell Thomas Jefferson, the policies Hamilton implemented at the Treasury Department were his policies, were the President's policies, as were the administration's policies towards Great Britain and France. As early as January 1789, long before Hamilton was nominated as Treasury Secretary, Washington made it clear that resolving the nation's ailing credit ranking and building the allegiance of the American people to the national government were his top priorities. Writing to the Marquis de Lafayette, Washington noted that his priority as president was to, quote, extricate my country from the embarrassments in which it is entangled through a want of credit and to establish a general system of policy which, if pursued, will ensure permanent felicity to that commonwealth. And I should note, as the editors of the papers of George Washington have observed, quote, there is no doubt that the President agreed completely with the implied objectives of the Treasury Secretary's fiscal program to create economic policies designed to produce a strong, centralized federal government. Remarkably, these facts continue to be ignored. And I think there's a reason for it that's fairly clear. By attacking Hamilton, or Hamilton, I should say, presented a more acceptable target than George Washington, the towering figure of George Washington. And one can see this phenomenon, particularly at work in accounts dealing with the suppression of the Whiskey Rebellion of 1794, when thousands of rebels in western Pennsylvania defied a federal estate tax on alcohol, armed themselves, and at one point threatened to burn Pittsburgh to the ground. Federal agents attempting to collect the tax were frequently attacked, and in one instance, a revenuer was held in a distillery for three days without food and told he could secure his freedom by submitting to having his nose ground off by a grindstone. Washington repressed this insurrection on the grounds that he was constitutionally obligated to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. But perhaps not surprisingly, that view tends to be dismissed in lore and legend. Instead, this episode of lawlessness on the part of whiskey distillers and their sympathizers is cele celebrated by many progressive historians as an example of grassroots democracy in action. According to this caricatured account, the whiskey rebels were simple country folk who abandoned their cracker barrels to defend their God-given right to produce moonshine. That might have been a little bit of a cheap shot, but uh, <laughs> you get the point. Uh, they fought to liberate themselves from an oppressive East Coast establishment led by Hamilton and the moneyed interests, all of whom, Hamilton, the moneyed interests, were traitors to the spirit of 1776. Now, in my view, this tale is Jeffersonian-inspired propaganda masquerading as history, but it is proven remarkably resilient. From the perspective of Washington and Hamilton, however, the, the Whiskey Rebellion was a challenge to the rule of law. And while hindsight might allow one to dismiss the seriousness of the Whiskey Rebellion, the threat was qu quite real to a newborn government whose viability was still open to question. Now, if you read accounts of the Whiskey Rebellion, Hamilton tends to be the villain in these portrayals of that event. But again, let me reiterate, it was President Washington who authorized the use of force against the rebels, and as many of you know, even led for a time the 15,000-man force 
which Washington cunning, cunningly named the Army of the Constitution, that marched into western Pennsylvania. Washington hailed the demise of the Whiskey Rebels, noting that the uprising suppression, quote, demonstrated that our prosperity rests on solid foundations, for the American people were ready to maintain the authority of laws against licentious invasions. For Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, however, Washington's response to the Whiskey Rebellion, or as Jefferson liked to call it, Hamilton's insurrection, was further evidence of the great man, George Washington's decline. The president, according to Jefferson and the Jeffersonians, had become the captive of a dictatorially inclined Alexander Hamilton. Nowhere were the conflicting visions of Washington's federalism and Jefferson's republicanism more pronounced than in their differing views on the French Revolution. Washington and Hamilton were repulsed by the ease with which the French revolutionaries and their American supporters countenanced mob violence and show trials as a means of purging elements of the old order. In Washington and Hamilton's view, there was no common ground between the American and French revolutions. The former was characterized by a devotion to liberty, the latter by a passion for licentiousness. Jefferson welcomed the violence in France as an appropriate method to cleanse the new republic of any reactionary holdovers, and argued that if the revolution extinguished all but one man and one woman, it would be well worth the price. And I should add, if you're not getting the gist of it, I suffer from a form of Jefferson derangement syndrome, so <laughs> bear with me if some of you are taking offense. But <laughs> this was the same Jefferson who would later propose executing any Virginia banker who cooperated with the Bank of the United States. Now, conventional wisdom, again, as I've already said, holds that the epic confrontation of the founding era occurred between Hamilton and Jefferson, with Washington somehow floating above it all, when in fact it occurred between Washington and Hamilton on one side and Jefferson and James Madison on the other. Now, Jefferson helped to foster this myth, celebrating his man-to-man -man confrontation with Hamilton by placing busts of Hamilton and himself if you've been to Monticello, you've probably noticed this, uh, facing each other in the entrance to his plantation. When startled, visitors would inquire as to why he would display a bust of Hamilton directly across from one of himself, Jefferson would dryly note, opposed in death as in life. Over time, some Jeffersonians came to see George Washington less as a victim of Hamilton's mass machinations and more as a co-conspirator. And this, by the way, was an accurate assessment of the situation. Washington, as I mentioned, is a full-blown Federalist, particularly by the end of his second term. Hamilton, as I've also said, remained firmly under the President's direction throughout his tenure as Treasury Secretary. And Jefferson himself once noted that Washington was always in accurate possession of all the facts and proceedings in every part of the Union and to whatsoever department they related. He formed a central point for the different branches, preserving a unity of object and action among them. George Washington ran his presidency. Alexander Hamilton was not the de facto prime minister. This was the, these policies that have generated controversy both then and now were the policies of President Washington. Some of you may also know that in the end, or towards the end of his life, Washington belatedly acknowledged Secretary of State Jefferson's re repeated attempts to undermine his policies. And in the final years of his life, Washington severed all contact with the Sage of Monticello. Jefferson reciprocated by refusing to attend the memorial service in the nation's capital after Washington died, despite the fact that he was the sitting vice president. The vice president could hardly restrain his glee over the news of Washington's passing, noting that it would allow for a reemergence, as he put it, of the Republican spirit. Martha Washington would later note that the two worst days of her life were December 14, 1799, the day her husband died, 
and a day in January 1801 when soon to be President Thomas Jefferson, whom she detested, paid a courtesy call to her at Mount Vernon. Now, <clears throat> let me shift gears a bit here and explain why I think uh, Alexander Hamilton, and in particular this critical alliance between Washington and Hamilton, has never quite received its due. Um, now, I, I'm well aware of the fact that Hamilton is now a Broadway celebrity, uh, having seen the Hamilton musical twice, I strongly recommend it if you can you know, get a second mortgage, buy a ticket. <laughs> um, but let me shift gears again and, and talk about how it came to pass that this critical alliance, and in particular Hamilton's standing within the American founding, uh, took on such a negative light, at least up until Lin-Manuel Miranda emerged on the scene. From the moment Hamilton was mortally wounded by Vice President Aaron Burr, the Jeffersonians had already done their best to relegate Hamilton to the ash heap of history. And after the duel, Jefferson's lieutenants scurried to contain the emotional impact of Hamilton's death from damaging their party's political prospects, including uh, future President Andrew Jackson, who warmly welcomed Aaron Burr into his home as a hero with a 21-gun salute after Burr fled west after the duel. Jefferson would spend much of his life spinning the historical, or his remaining life, and of course he lived for another 22 years after Hamilton was killed. Jefferson would use that time, as did John Adams, to spin the historical record, portraying his arch enemy Hamilton as an un-American, pro-British agent, intent on importing monarchy and corruption. Part of the Jeffersonian-Jacksonian contempt for Hamilton stemmed from the fact that Hamilton was an immigrant from the Caribbean, and thus his Americanism was constantly in question. The sense that Hamilton was not one of us fueled Jefferson's contempt for the upstart immigrant. He was appalled that Hamilton did not see eye to eye with him, despite having been, as, as Jefferson put it, received by Americans and given bread, and having honors heaped on his head, as Jefferson put it, from the moment he arrived in the United States. I'm going to take quite a leap of history, leap over some history here, but in the 20th century, Franklin Roosevelt led the effort to elevate Jefferson into the American pantheon, that beautiful monument down just off the, in the Tidal Basin. Uh, was erected by FDR at FDR's insistence, and he even played a small hand in terms of selecting the truncated quotes that adorn the walls of the Jefferson Memorial. Franklin Roosevelt saw himself as a new Jefferson for the new century. In fact, the only book review that Franklin Roosevelt ever wrote was a book review entitled, Is There a Jefferson on the Horizon? was written in 1925, and of course the Jefferson on the horizon was Franklin Roosevelt, who understood that if he were to win the presidency, being a New Yorker, he needed to win the votes of Southern Democrats who had already rejected New York Governor Al Smith, partly due to his Catholicism, uh, but FDR understood the importance of keeping the South in the Democratic fold. And so he writes this book review in 1925, Is There a Jefferson on the Horizon? And it's a review of Claude Bauer's book, Jefferson and Hamilton and the Struggle for Democracy in America. It's a book, by the way, that I do not recommend you read. <laughs> it is the most stereotypical, caricatured account you could possibly imagine of this sort of cigar-chomping cigar Alexander Hamilton who hates the great beast the American people, by the way, he never said that, but it's, tri it's attributed to him. Um, it, it's, it's a horrible book. FDR loved the book, writes this book review, and it's part of this effort on the part of Roosevelt to keep the South solidly in the Democratic column. So Jefferson saw him, excuse me, Roosevelt saw himself as a Jefferson for the new century, battling forces similar to those that confronted the sage of Monticello over a century earlier. Roosevelt led the drive for the Jefferson Memorial, as I mentioned, and also selected the quotes. Now, it's important to note that Hamilton's 
monument in Washington consisted of an undersized statue on the back side of the Treasury Building in Washington. But even this somewhat obscure monument was too much for all right-thinking mid-20th century progressives, particularly in light of the fact that this statue was erected during the corrupt Harding administration by its privileged Secretary of the Treasury, Andrew Mellon. So you may notice there's a statue of Albert Gallatin on the Pennsylvania side, Pennsylvania Avenue side of the Treasury Department. That was put there by the Democrats in the late 20s, early 30s in retaliation for the Hamilton statue. It was said time and again through the New Deal years that Hamilton considered the American people to be a great beast, or, which by the way is a fabricated quote, which we can talk about later if you wish, or, as Franklin Roosevelt put it, Hamilton had, quote, nothing but contempt for the opinion of the masses. Due to the efforts of Franklin Roosevelt, the image of Alexander Hamilton as an 18th century people-hating plutocrat took hold. By the time of the American entry into the Second World War, Hamilton's status in the American mind was slightly above that of Tokyo Rose. His reputation had sunk so low that Fortune magazine was compelled to observe that while Hamilton, quote, hated the people, end quote, he would have opposed the Nazis. <laughs> Hamilton's image in the American mind has improved somewhat at the dawn of the 21st century. And of course, Lin-Manuel Miranda is worthy of at least my acclaim for doing that. Uh, but this has also occurred in part due to Hamilton's position on race, which stands in stark contrast to that of Jefferson and members of his party. Jefferson, of course, being one of the largest slave owners in Virginia. Hamilton fought for a plan, along with his good friend John Lorenz, uh, to enlist African American soldiers in the Continental Army in exchange for their freedom and in 1785 was a co-founder of the New York Society to Abolish Slavery. He also supported Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian independence movement in the 1790s. And of course, Hamilton was a strong advocate for the Jay Treaty. And part of the reason for the strong Jeffersonian opposition to the Jay Treaty was that it did not include reparations for the slaves that the British had taken during the Revolutionary War. In fact, some members of the Jefferson Coalition were demanding that the slaves be returned to their owners. And Hamilton makes a strong case that while the uh, property demands of international law might require that, uh, there's a higher question here of whether returning somebody to bondage is what this new regime, an action that this new regime should undertake. Hamilton's immigrant status also contributed to burnishing his image, at least in this century, as did his sponsorship of a school in upstate New York for Native Americans. But Hamilton has never been a beloved figure among uh, both populists and also, I would say, progressive historians, as I've mentioned, due to the fact that unlike Thomas Jefferson, Hamilton rarely flattered the American public with feel-good rhetoric about their innate wisdom. Hamilton believed that the people could sometimes err, although he also believed that the rich and the privileged possessed the same failing. And while Jefferson privately held similar <coughs> beliefs about the people, um, Jefferson also, I would argue, understood the power of pandering. So, let me conclude because I would rather get to your questions, and I think I've said a few provocative things, so maybe, maybe there will be some questions. Uh, but I, I would argue that there is something shameful in the way Alexander Hamilton has been treated by many of his fellow citizens. Instead of celebrating the fact that Hamilton lived the American dream, rising from obscurity as an immigrant and becoming George Washington's most trusted confidant and founder of a great nation. His accomplishments have been caricatured and diminished by his partisan opponents. So it is my hope that this musical and other literature that's coming out on Hamilton, it's my hope that Americans will put aside this caricatured account 
of their early history, uh, particularly this aspect that pits Jefferson versus Hamilton and acknowledge the fact that George Washington was a much, as much a party to the Federalist platform, if you will, as Alexander Hamilton. Despite his disdain for faction, Washington became the leading Federalist of his time. And his collaboration with Alexander Hamilton proved, again, in my view, view to be the critical alliance of American history. Thank you. Thank you.